Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. As I mentioned yesterday, Dr. Mark Bailey is in San Antonio on a board assignment for these past couple of days. As you know, our chapel speaker today is Dr. Mike Lawson, Senior Professor of Christian Education. Dr. Lawson earned a THM here at Dallas Seminary and a PhD from the University of Oklahoma. In 1986, he joined the Christian Education Department at DTS following 17 years of pastoral ministry at the Metropolitan Baptist Church in Oklahoma City. In addition to his teaching responsibilities here at DTS, Dr. Lawson maintains an active speaking schedule and has served as a guest professor in a number of schools around the world, North America, Central America, Europe, Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. God has been pleased to grant him the privilege of travel and ministry in many of those areas. He has written a number of books and articles in the field of Christian education and is the creator of the Self-Guided Church Consultation Handbook, which is used by many in Doctor of Ministry research. Mike and his wife, Tish, have been married for 45 years. They have two adult children and two grandchildren whom they adore and enjoy. To relax and enjoy the great outdoors, Mike loves to fish. To fish for the mighty black bass of Lake Texoma, north of Dallas. And uh, we can hear his fish stories from time to time and enjoy that as well. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mike Lawson as our chapel speaker. This message was originally designed as a Valentine's Day message last spring and was snowed out. <laughs> Maybe that was a good thing. It's more of a journey than it is a sermon. And so I plan to follow the advice of King Henry VIII to his third wife when he said, I won't be keeping you long. I've entitled this message, What I've Learned About Love. In order for you to truly appreciate the depth of my learning, you need to know where I began. Clueless, clueless gets at the essence of it. But it was a highly sophisticated and nuanced cluelessness. <laughs> From my experience, most American males are relatively clueless when it comes to relationships. But I was advanced beyond my peers. If they had a clueless Olympics, I'm sure I would have meddled. And so I've searched in the ancient manuscripts to see if I could find some help to recapture those wonderful days especially for some of you who are either unable or are unwilling to think deeply about the nuances of cluelessness. Not long ago, I stumbled across just such a tightly reasoned and well-researched essay by none other than the alter ego of Irma Bombeck, the notable and quotable Mr. Dave Barry. His analysis of cluelessness in relationships, not to mention love, is quite remarkable. I'm going to read it in its entirety in order for all of us to savor these insights. Let's say a guy named Roger is attracted to a woman named Elaine. He asks her out to a movie and she accepts and they have a, a wonderful time together. A few nights later, he asks her out to dinner and again, they enjoy themselves. They continue to see each other regularly, and after a while, neither one of them is seeing anybody else. And then one evening when they're driving home, a thought occurs to Elaine. And without really thinking, she says it out loud. Do you realize that as of tonight, we've been seeing each other for exactly six months? And then there's silence. 
To Elaine, it seems like a very loud silence. She thinks to herself, wow, I wonder if it bothers him that I said that. Maybe he's been feeling confined by our relationship. Maybe he thinks I'm trying to push him into some kind of obligation. Maybe he's not really ready for that, and he isn't sure of this relationship. And Roger is thinking, gosh, six months. And Elaine is thinking, but hey. (laughs) I'm not so sure I want this kind of relationship either. Sometimes I wish I had a little more space so I'd have time to think about whether I really want us to keep going the way we're going, moving really steadily towards, I mean, what, what, what are we going towards after all? And are we just going to keep on seeing each other at this level of intimacy? Are we headed towards marriage, towards children, toward a lifetime together? Am I ready for that level of commitment? Do I really even know this person? <laughs> and Roger is thinking, so, that means, let's see, that was February. <laughs> and that was right after I took the car back to the dealer. <laughs> which means, let me check the odometer. Oh, my goodness, I'm overdue for an oil change. (laughs) And Elaine is thinking, he's upset. I can see it on his face. Maybe I'm reading this completely wrong. Maybe he wants more from our relationship, more intimacy, more commitment. Maybe he has sensed, even before I sensed it, that, that I was feeling some reservations. Yes, I bet that's it. That's why he's so reluctant to say anything about his own feelings. He's afraid of being rejected. And Roger is thinking, and I'm going to have them look at that transmission again, too. <laughs> I don't care what those morons say, it's still not shifting right. They better not try to blame it on the cold weather. I mean, what cold weather? It's 87 degrees outside, for pity's sake. This thing is shifting like a garbage truck, and I paid those incompetent thieves $600 to fix it. And Elaine is thinking, he's angry. (laughs) And I don't blame him. I'm angry, too. Wow, I feel so guilty putting him through this, but I can't help the way I feel. I'm just not sure. And Roger is thinking, they'll probably say it was only a 90-day warranty. That's exactly what they're going to say, those scumballs. And Elaine is thinking, maybe I'm just too idealistic. I mean, waiting for a knight to come riding up on his white horse when I'm sitting right next to a perfectly good person, a person I enjoy being with, a person I truly do care about, a person who seems to truly care about me, a person who is in pain because of my self-centered schoolgirl romantic fantasy. And Roger is thinking, warranty? They want a warranty. I'm going to give them a warranty. I'm going to take their warranty and... And Roger, Elaine says out loud, What? What? Roger says, rather startled. Please don't torture yourself like this, she says. Her eyes beginning to brim with tears. I mean, maybe I should never have. I mean, I feel so. And then she just breaks down sobbing. And Roger says, What? And Elaine says, I'm such a fool. I mean, I know there's no knight. I really know that. It's silly. There's no knight and there's no horse. (laughs) There's no horse, Roger says. You think I'm a fool, don't you? Elaine says, no, 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 Roger says. Gladly having the correct answer for once. (laughs) It's just, that it, it's just that I need more time, Elaine says. And there's this 15-second pause while Roger, thinking as fast as he can, tries to come up with a safe response. Finally, he comes up with one that he thinks might work. Yes, he says. <laughs> Elaine, deeply moved, <laughs> touches his hand. Oh, Roger, do you really feel that way, she says. What, what way, says Roger. <laughs> that way about time, says Elaine. Oh, says Roger, yes. 
Elaine turns to face him and gazes deeply into his eyes, causing him to become very nervous <laughs> about what she might say next, especially if it involves a horse. <laughs> At last she speaks. Thank you, Roger, she says. Oh, thank you, <laughs> says Roger. And then he takes her home and she lies on her bed, a conflicted, tortured soul. She weeps until dawn, whereas when Roger gets back to his place, he opens a bag of Doritos, <laughs> turns on the TV, and immediately becomes deeply involved in a rerun of a tennis match between two Czechoslovakians he never heard of. <laughs> a tiny voice in the far recesses of his mind tells him that something major was going on back there in the car. But he's pretty sure there's no way he would ever understand what it was. <laughs> and he figures it's just better if he doesn't think about it. This is also Roger's policy regarding world hunger. The next day, Elaine will call her closest friend, or perhaps two of them, and they will talk about this situation for six straight hours. <laughs> In painstaking detail, they will analyze everything she said, everything he said, going over it time and time again, exploring every word, expression, and gesture for nuances of meaning, considering every possible ramification. They will continue to discuss this subject off and on for weeks, maybe months, never reaching any definite conclusions, but never getting bored with it either. <laughs> Meanwhile, Roger, while playing racquetball one day with his mutual friend of his and Elaine's, will pause just before serving, frown, and say, Norm, did Elaine ever own a horse? <laughs> Now, when you begin as clueless about love as I was, you have nowhere to go but up. And that's where I began. The year was 1963, and my first lesson came shortly after I had trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior at the University of North Texas. And I was reading randomly in the Bible like you do as a new convert, just kind of popping it open and stumbling onto one thing after another, and I bumped into these words. Jesus said, a new command I give you, love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Two thoughts crossed my mind in those early days. First of all, I desperately wanted to be known as one of his disciples. There was no question about my intention. His forgiveness of my sin was still fresh on my mind, and actually I've never gotten over it. Second, I thought, how, how nice of Jesus to give us something so easy to do. I did notice the word command. It would be a long time before I found out that he had repeated that command five times at that dinner. It was important to him. Now, in a completely different area of my life, I had met the prettiest girl at the University of North Texas. And I was attracted to her from the moment I saw her. I mean, who wouldn't be? I mean, you can look at her. She's right over here. That was a good day. <laughs> I remember walking into that little drugstore and seeing her, and I said to my best friend, oh, that is a girl I need to get to know. Now, I had to work really hard to get her to pay any attention to me. I mean, I'd ask her out, and she'd say no, but I always took no as a definite maybe. <laughs> my persistence paid off. She agreed to go out with me. By 1965, I had talked her into marrying me. Now, that took some talking. I mean, look at me. 
But in the words of Larry the Cable Guy, <laughs> I got her done. Now, this brings me to my second lesson. First lesson, of course, was the command of Jesus to love one another. The second lesson actually occurred during the wedding ceremony. Now, I need to do a sidebar. I grew up in a home with a father who was an atheist, but he had more integrity than most Christians that I know. His word was an absolute final contract. You didn't need it put in writing. If my dad said it, that ended the discussion. I grew up with his explanation that if you want to be any kind of a man at all, you better keep your word. I never questioned it. I just assumed that was a rule of life. Never dawned on me that people broke their word. My last broke their contracts. If you say you're going to do it, you best do it or you're no man at all. Well, here I am. <laughs> Standing next to me is clearly the prettiest girl from the University of North Texas. I am exhilarated by her presence, and I am paralyzed by the words Dr. J. Dwight Pentecost is going to say. He said something like this. Dearly beloved, we are gathered together in the presence of God and these witnesses to join together this man and this woman. And I thought... Are you serious? Do we have to bring God into this? I mean, what happened to a nice, quiet ceremony? Then moments later, he asked me if I promised to love Letitia, that's her formal name, until death do us part. Somehow, I stammered out in the presence of God, in the presence of my friends, and in the presence of my family, I do. And that promise struck me. It was a huge weight. I knew my family, knew my friends had heard it. I knew God had heard it. I knew my father had heard it. Deep in my heart, though, I wondered, how in the world do you keep that promise? I'm 21 years old. How do you know how you're going to feel in five years or 10 years or 15 years? See, what I didn't know was that the warm, fuzzy feelings that I felt for this beautiful girl had nothing to do with what Jesus was talking about. For better or for worse, the two lessons were in place. The command of the Savior and the lifelong promise. I did pray for God's help but I didn't know how he would do it. By the fall of 1965, Tish and I, that's her, her name around the house and the family, we found ourselves here at the last place on earth we expected to be, which was Dallas Theological Seminary. I truly experienced the baptism by fire, so if some of you are experiencing that, know you have an ally on the faculty is not so much because of the academic load. That certainly is substantial. But it was because I was experiencing truth, and I was experiencing it faster than I could make it operational in my life. And I would come home frustrated because I knew that this vast amount of truth that I was being exposed to somehow was not finding its way into the decisions that I was making into my life experience. I cannot actually remember the sequence of the next two lessons. But I can tell you that they are the direct result of an assignment in Dr. Hendrick's Christian Home Course. By this time, a couple of years had passed. We were in the THM, moving steadily forward. The honeymoon between the two of us was definitely over. The pressure of school, work, church was beginning to take its toll on our conversations. Sidebar. You ever wondered about the difference between dating and marriage? 
Why is it that when you're dating, everything the other person does is so clever and wonderful and exciting? And after you're married, everything seems so irritating and annoying. What is that about? Well, that's where we were. It certainly was where I was. Now, with my advanced training, after all, I was in the TH and M. I could clearly see all of her shortcomings. And when I thought about her, I thought about those shortcomings. Until I ran face first into Philippians chapter 4. It was lesson number three. Do you listen to these words with me, please? Finally, brothers, he says, those of you who are in exegesis, I, help me figure out why it always addresses brothers in these verses like this. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. That wasn't what I was thinking about. It occurred to me that if I'm going to love Tish according to the Bible, what I'm going to have to do is to practice some good mental hygiene. I'm going to have to change and discipline my thought processes. And so instead of focusing on a handful of things that, that annoyed me, I needed to rethink about these things. And so I began, I actually did make a list of things in those early days. I wrote down all of the things that cor corresponded with these words about her. And as I would drive to seminary, I would flush those things through my mind. It was, it was an imperfect process in the beginning. But I've been practicing for 45 years. I've gotten a lot better. First lesson, it's a command, not an option. So if you say to somebody, I don't love you, you just violated the command. It's a promise, especially in marriage. And it's good mental hygiene. The last lesson creates pain in me to this very day. In his Christian home course, Dr. Hendricks challenged us to read 1 Corinthians 13 to our wives. Not bad. 1 Corinthians 13, that great love passage, always requested in marriage ceremonies, seemed appropriate. Why not? And then he added, since you promised to love your wives, I would like for you, where the text reads, love is, I would like for you to insert the words, I am. And that was a cheap shot. <laughs> you know how that passage begins, don't you? It's one thing to say love is. Love is patient. Love is kind. Of course, that's true. I'm going to tell you something, okay? Newsflash. Sherlock Holmes could not convict me of patience. To look your wife in the eyes and to say to her, I am patient? Well, after she quit laughing, I mean, uh, what in the world are you going to do? You can't escape that verse because it's a command. Remember, love is a command. It's not about warm, fuzzy feelings. Now, on the other side of that, I am in favor of warm, fuzzy feelings, and I still have them, but they're impossible to control. They come at times when you wish they weren't there, and they, they never arrive on time when you really need them. So, they're, they're, you know, but they're nice. I like, to, I like them. <laughs> but it's not what, what Jesus was talking about. It's not what the Bible was talking about. 
For the first time, I learned and realized that, that this was about patience and kindness. The great king demands it. This is not a recommendation. This is not a suggestion. Jesus anticipated that his servant wouldn't, who was a disciple wannabe. <laughs> I am a, still a disciple wannabe. Couldn't keep it. You can't keep the command. Not in yourself. And so he sent the spirit of the living God to indwell within us. The great love that God has for the world is to be reproduced in us as individuals, first of all, to our family, and then be extended to the Christian community, and ultimately, if we really do become followers of God, even to our enemies. What bothers me is that this is an instant barometer of my spiritual life. If I'm impatient with Tish, that's not a commentary on her. It's not even a commentary on my own nature. It's a commentary on my relationship with the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit always produces love. That's what the fruit of the Spirit means. So if I'm impatient, I've just demonstrated before my family and my friends and God that I have hindered the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So what have I learned about love? Well, I've learned that it was a command, that in marriage it's a lifelong process, that if you're going to really do it well, you have to practice good, wholesome mental hygiene. And last, that you have to allow the Spirit of God to produce in you the patience and the kindness that He expects out of true love. He always wants to produce that in us. It is the love of God produced in us. Now, I'm always looking for easy ways to remember things. My memory is bad. And so I want to leave you with a parable. It's the parable of the bald man. <laughs> you probably have heard it before. It is said of men who are bald here that they are thinkers. It is said of men who are bald back here that they are lovers. But it's said of men who are bald from here to here, they just think they're lovers. <laughs> but I'd like to borrow, to borrow a little sentence structure from Forrest Gump, who said, bald is as bald does. In the final analysis, there may be more bald men than we think. How terrible it would be if you stood in the presence of the great king and he said, you just thought you were a lover. <laughs>